الحمد لله الحمد لله ما شاء الله تبارك الله سي الحمد لله guys الحمد لله it's so nice to be back الحمد لله ثم الحمد لله we thank Allah سي الحمد لله we thank Allah for all of his blessings and especially the blessing of gathering here after three long enduring years after three years of enduring a crisis the likes of which none of us could ever have predicted who amongst us has not been affected by the COVID crisis subhanallah brothers and sisters every one of us here today and I speak as well for myself we have lost family and friends in the last two and a half years may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive all of them and grant them firdaus and grant them the death of a shah shaheed insha'Allah ta'ala but Allah has chosen us to move on our times will come by the way all of our times will come but Allah has chosen us and a part of appreciating those blessings that he has chosen us to continue is that we appreciate and thank him for all that we took for granted Muslims appreciate those small blessings that we didn't even recognize as being blessings family gatherings who could have ever thought that family gatherings would be taken away from us? Coming together in these large congregations, the hustle and bustle, the chaos of life that we typically did not like, when it was taken away from us, we realized that was a blessing that we wanted back. And alhamdulillah, we're on our track to normalcy, so we thank Allah for that. But dear brothers and sisters, a part of acknowledging the blessings Allah has given us, is to also acknowledge our brothers and sisters who don't have those blessings. A part of being thankful to Allah is to see around us and those who don't have it to make dua for them, to feel for them. Otherwise, this will lead to arrogance. So as we are gathered here today, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, I've been told almost 10,000 strong over here and in the gatherings and in the musalla and in the rooms outside. One of the largest gatherings of Muslims in North America. As we're gathered here today, as we're gathered here today, brothers and sisters, and wallahi, we are thankful that we are here. We also have to remember that there are those who are not able to display their Islam. There are those who are being persecuted simply for the crime, quote-unquote, of reading the Qur'an, of growing a beard, of going to the masjid, of having gone for Hajj and Umrah 10, 15, 20 years ago. I speak, dear brothers and sisters, of our Uyghur brothers and sisters in China. I speak of mass persecution, the likes of which has not taken place since World War II. What we are seeing here it is an ethnocide, not a genocide, an ethnocide. The United Nations has documented the reality of what is, what is happening. Over one million people, Muslims, Uyghurs, have been gathered up and thrown into what they call, concentra what they call education camps, which are nothing but concentration camps. They have been separated from their families. Children have been taken away from parents and put into households of the Han Chinese. Our young sisters have been taken and forcibly married into the broader population. And those children, our sisters, the people in the concentration concentration camps they are forbidden from anything that is remotely religious no Quran no salah no kalima they're forced to eat pork they're forced to drink alcohol they are being deprogrammed in order that they don't want them to be killed that's a genocide what is an ethnocide brothers and sisters pay attention to this an ethnocide 
You don't want to destroy the bodies. You want to keep the bodies for your national, for your national GDP. You want to keep the bodies to be workers in your country, but you want to destroy the souls. You want to destroy their culture. You want to destroy their religion. This is called an ethnocide. What happened in World War II was a genocide. They killed the people. What's happening in China right now, it is an ethnocide. They want to kill the spirit of Islam. They want to kill the religion of of these people and for the last decade they have been doing this right under the noses of the entire world brothers and sisters after World War II, the world came together and they said, never again. After World War II, the great superpowers said, not under our watch. Since World War II, nothing like this has happened and yet here we see it. Where are those slogans of never again? What happened to not under our watch? To give you one simple example, recently Russia invaded Ukraine and no doubt that is something bad. We don't like any loss of life. Immediately the NATO superpowers got involved, boycotted Russia, put the, against them taxes, Levite fines, increased the price of oil, have many restrictions. People in Russia can't use their regular credit cards, PayPal. They did not like this. They took action. They put in soft pressure. Do you know what has happened with China? Not a single thing. Why, brothers and sisters, why? Is certain blood cheaper than others? Are certain ethnicities not as important as others? So please spare me the slogans of never again. We all see through the hypocrisy. We don't expect much from them. But we as Muslims cannot forget the plight of anyone who is persecuted for the kalima. Dear brothers and sisters, our Uyghur brothers and sisters are a case study. The only reason they are being persecuted is the kalima. That's it. They haven't done any crime. They haven't done anything illegal. They're being persecuted because they have an identity, a religion, a value system that is different from the dominant majority. What will our reaction be? The least that we can do as we gather together, we thank Allah for our blessings. The least that we can do is to feel the pain of our brothers and sisters, to make dua for them, to point out the double standards and hypocrisy, to constantly bring up this in social media. That's the least that we can do. Anything less than this, honestly, subhanAllah, it's a weakness of Iman. The least we can do, make dua and bring up these issues so that people don't forget. Also, while we're talking about issues of the globe, let us also not forget other places that we need to be cautious about. Other places where things are happening that are extremely problematic. As we speak, another power has already risen up. A power that is similar to Nazi Germany ideals. An ideology, a far-right ideology that is actually directly linked to Nazis. You know what? When we talk about regimes, we like to say, oh, these are Nazi-type regimes. When we talk about dictators, we say, oh, these are like Hitler. And we're correct a lot of times. The current country that I'm talking about and the current political party that I'm talking about, this isn't just Nazi-like. It isn't just Hitler-esque. No. Factually speaking, what we are seeing with the BJP in India it is directly linked to the Nazi party of Germany. Let me explain. Let me explain. Brothers and sisters, we need to stand up and educate the world what's going on. The Nazi party of Germany back in the 1920s, it got some of its ideals and some of its motifs and some of its slogans and even some of its, its symbols, you know, the, the four you know, stars that they have. It got it from a radical strand of Hinduism. The notion of Aryan purity, that you know, four star that they have. Where is it from? It's from a radical strand of Hinduism. And that's why Hitler was talking about the purity of the Aryan race. The Aryan race is actually allegedly an ancient Indian race. Why is Hitler talking about the Aryan race? Because there were certain people from that Hindu mythology that he got this from. That same mythology, it gave rise to an organization called the RSS. Look this up. 
RSS was active in the 30s and 40s. They had a direct relationship with the Nazis of Germany. One of the members of the RSS was the one who assassinated Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi, the one who didn't want to fight because he was a pacifist. They felt Mahatma Gandhi had betrayed the Hindu religion, had betrayed Hindu ideals. So a Hindu radical who belonged to the RSS assassinated Mahatma Gandhi. The RSS was dissolved for a period of time. Another party was created to take up those ideals that party is the BJP party that is currently in charge of India so the BJP is literally no exaggeration it is literally a younger cousin of the Nazi party there is no exaggeration to say this and both Nazism and the BJP they have three things in common both Nazism and the BJP they have three things in common memorize them number one number one a warped ultra-nationalist ideal of race and of race purity. They're obsessed with race and racial identity. Like the Nazis wanted pure Germans, so the BJP has this notion of pure Indians. Number two, they have combined the worst aspects of a fanatical interpretation of religion. The Nazis were a type of Christian. The BJP is a type of Hindus. They've taken the worst elements of bigoted religion and they've combined it with the worst elements of nationalism and number three they take a minority of a different religion and a different race the Nazis took the Jews and everybody else and the BJP takes the Muslims and the Christians and they blame all of the problems of the world and all of the problems of their country they blame it on their minority when you have these three things together ultra-nationalism of your race, bigoted religion, and hatred of a minority. This is the recipe of genocide. You cannot have genocide without these three things together. We see this in Nazi Germany in the 1930s. And now, as we speak, the drums of war have been beating in India, beaten by the BJP and especially their main drummer, Mr. Modi, whom we know from the Gujarat massacre of 20 years ago. He has been thirsty for blood since that point in time. He has shown his true colors. He's not somebody new and unknown. Under his watch, a thousand Muslims, innocent Muslims, people in the trains were pulled aside and brutally killed. And what did he do? Nothing. He encouraged the police to participate. This is when he was a governor. In this country, he was banned for a decade because his blood was, his hands were dirty with Muslim blood. He was banned in America as an instigator of terrorists when he was a governor. When he became president, all of a sudden he's welcomed with open arms. Brothers and sisters, as we speak, the situation in India is deteriorating and wallahi, it is very, very terrifying. I plead to all of us, especially from a background of that subcontinent, I have to be explicit here, Indian Muslims, Pakistani Muslims, Bangla Muslims, Nepalese Muslims, that is our land, that is our culture, those are our people, we have been shaped by the identity of that land. If we are not going to take up that cause, if we're not going to stand up and preach the truth, if we are not going to preach truth to power, then who else is going to do that? So this is yet another cause that we have to stand up for. Brothers and sisters, the list goes on and on. Wallahi, sometimes, sometimes shaitan comes to you, makes you feel depressed even. What are we going to do? Palestine, wa ma ma Palestine. When will Palestine ever be solved? Since I was born, we're hearing about Palestine. I'm about to enter now my fifth decade. Still, Palestine is Palestine. Kashmir, other countries. Wallahi, shaitan comes, says, what are we going to do? And here is where our faith comes in, brothers and sisters. Our faith comes in. Why is this? Because Allah did not create us to live Jannah on earth. This is not Darul Salam. Darul Salam is the next life. Allah created this dunya to be Darul Ibtila, Darul Ikhtibar, Darul Imtihan. And so you know what? Even if we were to solve the BJP issue, even if Palestine were to be solved right now, even if Kashmir became peaceful, I guarantee you other problems would come. Why? Because this dunya, this world, this abode, it is a place of tests and trials. So the goal is we try our best to eliminate the tests and trials. If we're successful, alhamdulillah. If not, 
we continue to do what we can. And so we meet Allah and we say, Ya Allah, I tried. Ya Allah, I paid attention. Ya Allah, my heart was affected. Ya Allah, I gave of my time and my money. This is the goal. The goal is not necessarily, it's not necessarily, I'm saying it's not the immediate goal. Many of the Sahaba, they died before the conquest of Mecca. They died before the conquest of Mecca. Was their death in vain? Did they not see the, the, the wisdom of their suffering? No. They had a role to play. The people who entered Mecca had a role to play. And by the way, after the conquest of Mecca, the Muslim Ummah had other trials and tribulations, and it will continue to have trials and tribulations. So the goal is not necessarily to solve the problem immediately. The goal is to, listen to me carefully, attempt to solve the problem. The goal is to be careful, to be concerned. The goal is to have a heart of Iman. The goal is to genuinely feel the pain of others and then be affected and then try to eliminate that pain such that when we meet Allah, we say, Ya Rabb, I tried my best. That's the goal. But those who don't try, those who have no heart, Allahul Musta'an, Allah protect them. And by the way, it's not just political. Time is limited. I don't have time to go into every single thing, obviously. It's not just political we're issue where we're concerned with. No, as Muslims, we're concerned with every single problem that humanity is suffering with. As Muslims, we take on the challenges, especially those in our own culture. And you know, last week, and I have to mention this because I'm from the state, 300 miles from where I live, a few days ago, a brutal massacre occurred of innocent children. 19 innocent children were senselessly murdered for no reason whatsoever, along with their two teachers. This incident in this country, sadly, it's not unique and it's not rare. In the last 10 years, brothers and sisters, in this great land of America, over 1,000 mass shootings have taken place on school campuses. There is no other country on earth where this statistic even comes close. Wallahi, it is mind-boggling and I had to actually make sure this statistic is true. And I challenge you to look this up as, uh, as well. The statistic that I'm about to tell you, look it up yourselves. The number one cause of death of children and teenagers in this country. The number one cause of death of children and teenagers in this country. It's not drugs, it's not car accidents, it's not cancer, it's not falling sick. The number one cause of death of children and teenagers in the United States of America is gun violence. No other country on earth has this statistic. Now, brothers and sisters, we as Muslims, we can't just sit back and say, oh, that's their problem. Firstly, what world are you living in? Don't your children go to the same schools? Don't you live here as well? Secondly, when we live with the people, when we live in a society, their problems become our problems. These are our people. That's what the Prophet ﷺ demonstrated. You feed the hungry, you take care of the poor, you give shelter to those who have no shelter, you sponsor the orphan. In all of this, it doesn't matter the religion of the one you feed. It doesn't matter the religion of the orphan. It doesn't matter the religion of the one sick. Wallahi, if you have to ask the religion of the one who is sick, it is you who are sick and not the one who is sick. This is the fact of the matter. Our religion transcends other religions when it comes to helping them. So when we're talking about this endemic gun violence, one way to tackle it is to talk about legislation with guns and fire weapons. And there's no doubt that needs to be discussed, but this is not my area. I'm not a politician. I'm not somebody who deals with, you know, how to do, do with gun violence and whatnot. All I'll say, look at other Western countries, New Zealand, Canada, Australia, and look at what they have done and the success rates. That's one tangent. But I want to bring up another tangent. And I know, brothers and sisters, that this tangent is highly, highly sensitive. I know that what I'm about to say might cause some people to jump on this clip and spread it and say oh this guy is saying this and that but you know what me not talking about your gun problem and gun violence is not going to make it go away somebody has to point out a brutal reality before we jump to the gun violence before we jump in trying to legislate why a young man shouldn't have a gun which to me makes complete common sense before we even get there i have a very difficult question that all of us have to ask ourselves and that is the following 
Why? In this particular country, why are so many young men wanting to commit mass violence against innocent people? I mean, a 17-year-old should not be thinking about harming 20 school children. A 17-year-old should be daydreaming about his future, his job, his family, his children. Yet, the highest number, the, 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 the rate of depression and of teen suicide the rate of violence in that age group has reached proportions that are unprecedented in human history. Before we get to controlling gun violence, we have to ask ourselves, where is this evil, dastardly, vile notion of killing innocents coming from? And I will tell you one statistic, just one. Do your research. There was a number of studies done profiling the mass shooters of the last 10 years. I read a number of them. Two statistics stuck out to me. Two statistics. Now, I'm not blaming everything on this, but statistics speak for themselves. Statistic number one, 85% of mass shooters in this country had zero affiliation with any religion. 85% have nothing to do with God, with church, with synagogue, with mosque. 85% have no spirituality in their lives. And statistic number two, 75% of mass shooters come from broken homes where one or both, and typically the father, is absent. 75% of mass shooters come from broken homes. I'm sorry to be blunt about this, and I know some people might take this clip and read into it. But me not talking about this statistic is not going to change the endemic violence that is rampant in this country. When you are going to make fun of religion, ban religion, kick religion out of every single sphere, when you're going to make your media such that being religious is considered backward and abandoning religion is cool, well then, what else are you going to do except take the most important thing that a person should have and leave it with nothing but emptiness? Also, when it comes to the family, and oh my God, how much can be said about the family? This society and culture, and I have to be blunt, and I'm a part of this society and culture. I was born and raised here, but I have to call a spade a spade. They have destroyed the foundation of society by completely tearing apart the traditional family structure. They have opened the door for hedonism, for promiscuity, for easy sex. They have made everything permissible. Even that which was considered immoral is now considered moral. What do you think is going to happen when you destroy the bedrock of society? You can talk as much as you want. You cannot change biology. And biology teaches us that a child needs the love of a father and the love of a mother. That is the default. When you break this apart and you take a father away or you encourage other alternatives, quote unquote, there are going to be repercussions. Now, I'm not saying all of this is directly linked only to these two causes. No, there are other causes as well. But wallahi, I will say, these two causes are self-evident. You don't have God and you're destroying family. What is going to happen? These young men will have no purpose in life. They have no conscience. They have no positive role model. They don't even care. They kill their own grandmothers. Can you, I mean, well, I mean, I'm speechless. How can a 17 year old turn against the very person that raised and then go and massacre innocent children? Where does this come from? These ideas don't even cross the minds of 99% of normal human beings. And yet in this country, it is becoming mainstream and normal. So before we get to gun violence and before we get to legislation, which should also be done, I understand that, we have to get to morality, religiosity, spirituality, family, and religion. And this is where, brothers and sisters, we as Muslims, as American Muslims, we have a role to play. We have a role to play in this broader society. 
This country, and it is our country. When I criticize it, I live here. This is my people. My children are here. This is my country. So my criticism should not be taken as that of an outsider. My criticism is because I want this country to be better. My criticism is because I want to raise the bar, not because I want to despise it. No, this country has gone down a path of moral bankruptcy. It has gone down a path of moral bankruptcy where night becomes day, day becomes night. The, the basic definition of male and female is being tinkered with. No civilization in human history ever said this. And yet here we are saying this right now. When you're going to go down this route, there will be repercussions. So dear Muslims, what is our role? Our role is to remain sane when everybody else seems to be going mad. Our role is to stand up and speak the truth when it is politically incorrect to speak the truth. Our role is to demonstrate what it means to be people of faith when nobody around us is a person of faith. Our role is to show what it means to have a family, a husband and wife and children. What happens when you have a loving, faith-based family so that the people around us eventually return to their fitras, to their sanities, to their common sense, which they will do, inshallah ta'ala, if we stand up to that role. This is what our role is, brothers and sisters. And I'm not the one saying this. It's in the Quran. It's in the Quran. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat lin nas. You are the best of ummas brought out for mankind. Why? Because you believe in Allah. You command what is good. You forbid what is evil. Dear Muslims, my time is up. But let me finish by stating certain facts. Brothers and sisters, realize that religion is the only thing that gives us hope in an otherwise hopeless world. Recognize that Iman in Allah gives us meaning for existence in an otherwise meaningless world. Without Allah, our lives become meaningless. Know that the Quran is the ultimate source of guidance and there is no guidance other than the Quran. Otherwise, if we leave guidance to the whims of mankind, then we see what is happening. What is halal today becomes haram tomorrow. tomorrow. What is permitted today becomes uh, impermitted tomorrow. We cannot leave guidance to the hands of men. Allah has revealed the guidance of the Quran. Acknowledge, dear Muslims, that our Sharia ah teaches us values when mankind's values continue to change with time. Muslims, the bottom line is very simple. It's very simple. Islam gives us nobility. Islam gives us nobility. And without it, we have no nobility. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, as is always my habit, and wallahi, it's so good to resurrect this habit. At every Ikna convention for the last five years, and I've been speaking at Ikna conventions for, I think, 14 years now, alhamdulillah. By the way, my first Ikna convention I attended was 29 years ago, when I was a teenager. I attended the first Ikna convention with my parents when it was in Buffalo, New York. And here I am speaking on stage, alhamdulillah, after so many years. As has been my habit for the last few years when we conclude the Ikna convention, when I conclude the Ikna convention, now that we've gathered, mashallah, almost 10,000 strong, how can we not show the world what we believe? How can we not demonstrate to mankind with the core essentials of our faith? Let us join together in acknowledging that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the greatest, that Allah is the grandest, that Allah is the most important, that Allah is the most significant entity in our lives. I want us all to come together to say a takbir, a takbir that comes not just from the tongue, not just from the vocal cords, but from the depths of the heart, from the core of our soul. I want us to say Allahu Akbar and mean it, that nothing is worthwhile other than Allah. Nothing is more majestic than Allah. Nothing is great than Allah. I want us to come together and say the takbir in one unified voice. Are we ready to do that? Yeah. Takbir! Allah. Raise the bar, raise the bar high. Takbir! Allah. One more time, we want the walls of this convention to shake. Takbir! Allahu Akbar! Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.